Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Nia Glenn, the chair of the Historic Districts Commission, and I live at 388 Lowell Road, and that's in the Barrett Farm District. This is a public neighborhood workshop on the potential expansion of the Main Street Historic District, November 14, 2018. Tonight, we'd like to get feedback from all of you, provide some information, and answer your questions. Mark Giddings, our vice chair, has spearheaded this effort, and he will be giving a brief presentation, and then we'll open it up to questions and comments. But first, I'd like to introduce the two other HDC members who are with us tonight. Maybe you'd stand. Peter Nobley and Justin King. Thank you. I'd also like to introduce Heather Gill, senior planner in the Department of Planning, and she is a wealth of information and a great resource for all of us, as is Heather Carey, who's administrative assistance. Mark? Thank you, Nia. As Nia said, I'm, I'm Mark Giddings. I live at 474 Barrettsville Road here in town um, and have been on the commission for five or six years, I guess. I appreciate everybody taking the time to be with us this evening. It's really about what you folks want to do. Um, I'm going to give a brief presentation on what we're trying to accomplish, a little bit about the HDC, and then open it up for questions after that. Okay. Um, first, starting with what we do and what we're trying to do. We have six HDC districts, as I'm sure everybody realizes. You know, the Church Street over in West Concord, um, the Main Street with the part that we're going to try to expand right there, um, the American Mile, which is over here, Monument Square, and lastly, the Barrett's Farm that extends over here. Um, a little history, I guess, about why we're trying to accomplish this and why we think it's worth it. It really started with um, the Sudbury Road area and all of the very important historical homes that are there. Um, um, you can change the slide, okay? That's the area. And it's part of the Concord's long range plan to expand the historic district, okay? The town sees great value in that um, and that's a big part of why we're here today, okay? Oh, sorry, because I walk away from the microphone. That's why, I apologize. Okay, thanks. So anyways, I'll repeat what I just said because that's critical to this meeting, is that it's part of Concord's long-range plans to expand the, the historic district because of the historic nature of the town, okay? Um, the important part about this is, I don't want to read the whole thing. You can look at it as you want is it talks a little bit about what the historic district designation offers protection against demolition and insensitive alterations. That's really the core of what we try to accomplish, okay? Um, and I'll get into it a little bit further as to what, you know, how we go about that. Go ahead. I'm sure most of you are aware of the area that we're talking about. Um, again, it started with the Sudbury Road area so many of those homes are very historically significant, um, but the way to do it is to expand the Main Street District as opposed to trying to establish a separate district. And that was sort of our rationale. Sure. I'll, I'll, is that better? Okay, sorry. I'll get it. Um, it started with the Sudbury Road area and all the historic homes that are on that that we felt was so critical to have protection for. Um, but the, the best way to accomplish that is to expand the Main Street area and incorporate those homes and those properties between Main Street and Sudbury Road. As I'm sure you're all aware, the area has varied architectural styles and vintages. Um, there is no single style that you see within it. This is a representation of some of the homes that you're quite familiar with. Go ahead. Some of Concord's most famous um, people have historically lived in these homes. Um, we obviously believe that it's uh, 
of great importance to uh, maintain the integrity of them? Go ahead. A little bit about what the HTC does. We're really just 10 citizens within the town that meet twice a month to review uh, certificates of appropriate. Um, uh, basically what we look at are those things that are in the public way, meaning from the street or from one of the rivers. We have no jurisdiction over plantings or what goes on within a house. We don't review nor would we want to review any reconstruction projects that are just replacement in kind. Um, that's not our area. Okay, we're basically just trying to maintain the integrity of the neighborhoods uh, the way they are. Go ahead. A little bit about what we've done, our, our work, if you will. This is a snapshot of the Commission's efforts and output over the last few years. It's important to note how few applications are denied. We work hard to let people manage their own properties, but hope to give guidance and support the Commission's purpose. I thought it was interesting to show three properties that we've been involved in over the last couple of years. Um, this is 12 Bow Street. Um, it was a house that was in bad repair, had no foundation, had shifted on its base. Um, people came to us and wanted to tear it down. Um, we worked very closely with the architect and the developer to redo the house without disrupting the streetscape. And I think we're able to accomplish that. For those that aren't familiar with it, that's what it looked like originally. And that's what the new house looks like. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's 12 Bow Street, it's what it is. Okay, and, and although the house was not historically significant, it wasn't built in 1750, the design and style of the house was critical to the streetscape of the neighborhood, which is within the historic district, okay? Um, and we were pleased that we were able to help the developer um, accomplish that within the confines of our purpose. Make sense? Um, another one that we were quite proud of was 50 Monument Street that you're probably aware of. This was a house that again was in somewhat disrepair that they wanted to do some significant changes to, and they did. The, you, what you can't see is the back of this house where they changed it dramatically, but basically what they were able to do was take this house and make it appropriate with the amenities and style of a modern house and yet still keep the outlook from the front of the street, okay? And the last one that I wanted to show you was one that we worked hard on, on 445 Lowell Road. This was actually one of our denials because when this came to us, they wanted to tear down this house. Um, and we worked again with the architect and the builder to salvage the house and redo it. So what you're seeing is the old house and the new house. And again, they'd wanted to tear it down. And we were able to accomplish what we thought was a significant restoration of a somewhat historic house in town. So, okay, go ahead. This slide shows the area that we're talking about 140 years ago. Concord is often described as a charming town. It's the HDC's endeavors to protect and cultivate this charm. We appreciate you taking time to join us this evening. As we have stated, we're here to listen and answer questions. We believe expanding the Main Street District is worth the effort that we're taking. So at that point, we'll open it up for questions. I hope we've given a little bit of a brief sort of story of what the commission does, um, but obviously we'd love to have any more questions you have, okay? Right, so everybody ready with their questions? Yeah. What I, if I, excuse me, yeah. if I may, I'm just gonna pass the mic okay. to you. If you'd be kind of to say your name and where you're from. Uh, Ralph Earl, 50 Belknap Street. Um, I have uh, two questions at least to start. <laughs> um, 
where did the idea of expanding the Main Street Historic District come from? Did it come from residents, or did it come from the HDC, or did it come from the Long Range Plan, or some combination thereof? A combination of all of them. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You had another. And question. the second question: You showed those uh, pie charts of the uh, of the uh, applications that were g given in a certificate of appropriateness. Um, what's the average time between the filing of a permit application and the granting of the COA? Thank you. Good question. Two separate areas. Okay. So two separate questions. Okay. Um, the first one is the um, where did this concept come from? Um, we've at the HDC for years has wanted to expand into, uh, to expand the district, but it really comes from Concord's envision. Okay, you can't hear me. That's fine. Is that is that better? I could actually stand there without the microphone. You could probably hear me better. Okay, but I'll I'll try this. Okay, so the gentleman asked about where the impetus came to expand the Main Street District, okay? And it came from the Concord's long range plan, Envision Concord, and it also came from the HDC. It's our purpose to try to protect the charm of Concord. Does that answer your question? Okay. The second question is, you asked about the time frame between application process and when you can go forward with it. I think Heather's in a better chance, better place to answer that question. Go ahead. So we do have um, application deadlines because we do have to run legal advertisements in the journal and abutters get notification of a public hearing, um, kind of like you received a mailing today. If you were to do something, your abutters would also receive a notification of the meeting. Um, so there is a couple weeks span between the deadline and the meeting date. Um, and generally, applications are approved at the first meeting. Um, sometimes they are continued for um, further information. Other times they're continued because they're larger projects that are adding additions or significant changes to a structure. And the Historic Districts Commission likes to do a site visit. Um, in that case, those um, applications would be continued to a second meeting where a site visit would be done that morning and the application would be taken up again that evening. Um, the HDC does meet twice a month. Great. Next question. Anybody? What if there's damage to, your, to the front of your house and you yeah. need to fix Ask it that up? Again. Can you hear me? What if there's damage to your house and you have, need to fix it up? We have, we have nothing to do with reconstruction, you know, replacement in kind. That's, you don't have to put an application in for it. You, that's called a replacement in kind. You don't even put an application in okay, for it. Okay, thank you. We have nothing to do with that. So that's the same thing as if, you know, your house needs to be repainted. It's been a long time since it was repainted. You're painting it the same color, go right ahead. If you're fixing your shutters, anything of that nature, as Mark says, it's called replacement in kind. Go ahead. You don't even have to give us a call. If you're changing your color, seriously. Yes, if you're changing your color, I'm afraid you do have to come for approval. And let me ask you this. How many, I, I heard the answer before, but as a practical matter, by the, the day I put in my, my application, how many days does it take before I'll get a decision? I mean, Heather, would you just repeat that, please? How many days to get a decision? I believe there's the three weeks in between the deadline and the meeting date. So a deadline to submit the application so that we can run the legal ads in time for that scheduled meeting. Does that answer your question, sir? Senator? Next question. You were... Let me bring the mic around to you. Do be kind enough to say who you are. Hi, I'm Dick Cross. I live at 38 Academy Lane. Um, it's tangential. Uh, we moved to Concord a little more than 40 years ago because we thought it was a beautiful place to live, which it has been. Um, my, my question is not about anything in the blue up there, but it's about something in the green. Uh, does, this, does, this, does this board have anything to do with what's being built at the library? 
which is just an affront to any of those houses that are close to it. Okay, the question is, does the HDC have anything to do with what's happening at the library? Um, I think the answer that I could give to that is that the library is currently within the Main Street Historic District, so anything the library wishes to do, if it's an expansion, whatever, they would come before the HDC and that would be an application that we would consider like any other application. Uh, well, no, all of that green is the Main Street. It's already within the district, okay? And part of the process is for us to post in the newspaper when somebody wants to do something within the district. And we have an open meeting, and we love to have residents come and say, you know, I live next door to that, and I don't really want it, okay? Um, and on occasion we do, but we don't get that much of it, okay? So. But certainly it is an open public meeting, and anything that's on the agenda that is something that you care about Please come and say what you think. That's what it's all about. Uh, Diane Proctor, 57 Sudbury Road. I have two questions for you. Um, the first is, having read the, um, the 2030 uh, Envision Concord program, I didn't see anything in that document that particularly um, urged the town to expand its historic district, and I wonder if you could point to a specific reference in that document that, that so encourages. They've certainly asked us to maintain the character of Concord. They've also asked us to think about affordable housing. They've also asked us to scatter affordable housing. I mean, they've all sorts of questions about zoning in that document. I mean, it's a complicated and interesting document in terms of housing and its future in Concord. And I just wonder if you could speak specifically to the section that, that talks about expanding the historic district. The second question is the HDC, I believe, has been pretty important in determining whether a, a cell tower uh, could be built on Emerson Umbrella or in another place in our neighborhood, in our collective neighborhood. Um, and I wonder, if there's an opportunity for the HDC to reconsider its adjudication um, of an earlier decision about whether Kai's Road would be an appropriate location for a cell tower rather than an intrusion into the middle of a neighborhood filled with people and children. Thank you. Yeah, sure, I can tackle that. Okay, first of all, I can't point out specifically where in the long range plan if I had a few minutes, I can pull it up for you. Okay. okay. And we can get that for you if you'd like. Okay. So, but they do, you know, it talks about a lot of aspects of the town that are important. Okay. And one of them is the historic district. Okay. So much the same as open farmland is important to the town. You know, all of those things were listed. Okay. Um, we can get that for you if you'd like. Okay. Right. And reg as regard the second question. Um, the cell tower, and I know this is a really uh, important matter in town and a lot of emotion around it. Um, if uh, a company wished to reapply for a cell tower in one of the historic districts, as what happened, I believe it was 2007, uh, I think it was 2007, they would put in an application just like everybody else and come before us and one thing to point out, though, is that the HDC is strictly a, a group where we consider what is visible from the public way and what is visible in the historic district, et cetera. We unfortunately have no purview over the health effects of a cell tower or any of the many important issues, but for us, it is purely visual. Um, so everybody is welcome to come to those hearings and, and say what they think, but please understand that we, our hands are tied to simply what is appropriate in the historic district from a visual standpoint. Can I just take some other questions first? Thank you. Jane Mandillo, 50 Belknap Street. Um, I have two questions. The first one is, can you give us some examples of things that didn't get approved and why? And then when, you, uh, when the Historic District Commission gets involved, um, as in some of the examples you showed, do you attempt to have it be sort of an even uh, D 
deal from an economic perspective for the owner, or does the owner have to incur more expense because the Historic District Commission got involved? Well, the, the one that I can point out is the um, one on Lowell Road that I said that was a denial. Okay, that comes to mind that I've been at it. Okay. Um, what else comes to mind? What else comes to mind, Heather, on denial? There was um, a ramp that was denied on Main Street, a handicap ramp for right. Concord Academy, and we worked with them um, to find an appropriate solution um, right. to make that building handicapped accessible without disrupting the historic nature of Main Street. Um, another one was solar panels on the front facade of a house um, that was, I believe it was on Main Street, it was a significant um, facade on Main Street. Um, and then another one um, was the relocation of a garage, um, which I don't have that in front of me, so I don't have specifics on that, but um, all this information is public record and you can view the files in our office at any time. Yeah, and the other one that comes to mind was the solar panels on Lowell Road that were facing Lowell Road that we asked them, you know, but because of the, the sunlight, it had to go on that side of the house, it couldn't go on the back side, so we did deny that, I remember. Okay, and repeat your second question for me. Sorry, I forgot your second yeah. question. It's okay. It's, it's about the cost. So, um, right. you know, if, yeah. if an I owner mean, needs to incur additional cost because of the Historic District Commission um, comments, what, how do you deal with that? It, that's, that's a good question. Okay, I think we struggle with that. We try not to let economic decisions uh, force our decision because oftentimes we don't have control over that. You know, it's a developer that perhaps went in and paid a lot of money for a house and then is trying to recoup his money and stuff. We weren't on the front side of that decision making, okay? But we, are, we try to be sensitive to it. As I've said a couple of times at these meetings, it's your house. You should be able to do with it as you choose to do, okay? We just can't let it impact the area around it. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with Mark. I think we try very hard to work with you, um, and if you're coming before us with something that we're thinking, eh, maybe we can suggest other suggestions that you may not even be aware of. So it's not just a question we're just saying no, it's just saying have you considered these other um, considerations, other options, but we are sensitive to the cost involved, and we try very hard you know, not to just impose some material on you that costs 10 times more than what you're trying to do, so. Bob, <coughs> excuse me, Bob Treitman, 43 Middle Street. Um, two questions, one, uh, about 20 years ago there was a proposed addition to the, the, this, and I was wondering, is this the same map or has it changed and if, if it's changed, how? That's question number one. Question number two, unrelated. Number 30 Middle Street is an abandoned, basically, well, it's not an abandoned house. It's been unoccupied for over 10 years. 1960s, I assumed at some point, I assume at some point it will be knocked down and replaced with something. And I'm wondering how the HDC, given that there was no existing historic structure there to work with, would they just assume, look for uh, the proper style and, and, and yeah, there's, there's, there's two things, you know, first of all, we hate demolition, okay, just because once it's gone, it's gone, okay, and there's nothing you can do about that, okay. Generally, our guidelines are that it be of no historical significance and that it be structurally unsound, okay, and then we would work with the architect, the owner, the developer, whoever it is, to try to build a house like we did on 12 Bow Street that doesn't disturb the streetscape, okay. Um, which is a bit of a challenge because, as you know, everybody wants to build 4,000 square foot houses and oftentimes what's there is a 2,000 square foot house, which was the Bow Street, that was a 1,900 square foot house that they wanted to put a 4,000 square foot house on and it just, it didn't fit, okay? They were able to do it, um, so does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, and I, I can't speak to that, I'm sorry. I know that it was, it was, a while ago that they tried to expand the district. This is basically what we came up with when we looked at, as I said, Sudbury Road being, you know, sort of the critical component to it, okay, and then moving it over to Main Street because it made more sense just to expand the Main Street district. I believe okay. it was over on Hubbard Street 
Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure of the boundaries that were proposed, but I believe it included Hubbard Street before. And, and we're trying to be selective and don't want to bite off more than we can chew, if you will. Okay, so we thought this was a great place to start. Great place to start. Okay. So. A logical place to start. So, sorry. Tom Brosnahan, 37 Middle Street. When my wife and I bought our house, uh, um, we bought it because of the beauty of the street and its historic nature. We were told at the time that we had the the right, that is, the, the permitting would allow us to build a garage in front of it. If you know uh, 37 Middle Street, it's the little one that's set back from the street. Building a garage in front would be a, a monstrosity. We have and have no intention. We did also look into solar panels, which uh, we may decide to do at some point. Both of these things would impact the view from the street. And therefore, it seems to me that we are suffering a diminution of value of the house without compensation if it is in a historic district. That's a tough one to answer. There's, there's no question, I'll be honest with you, if you came before us to put a garage in the front, basically the front lawn. I'm thinking more of selling I'm sorry. the house. Um, yeah. Well, not necessarily. not necessarily. Okay, so if you, if you take the, the house that was up on the screen over on Lowell Road, um, they wanted to have a garage. And we would normally never put a garage on the front side of the house, just if we had choices of where else a garage could go. The number one choice is to get it as far out of view as possible. The alternative was to run the driveway all the way along the front of the house, because the house sat sideways, run the uh, driveway all the way along the front of the house, destroy the entire vista down to the river, and put a garage in the, in the back. And in the end, we decided that the best way to handle it was to tuck the garage sideways into the, into the, on, into the lot line at the front side of the house. But the, the house was still projected forward, pushed the garage back against the side boundary, and that achieved what everybody wanted. We were happy, they were happy, they got their garage. So it doesn't automatically mean, if it's going in the front, that it's, it's a no. It just means we all have to work really hard to make it something that's visually you know, appealing for the street. But I can appreciate your concern about value. Sorry, the garage was one thing. What was the other? Solar panels. The solar panels. The solar panels, I think, is a tough one for the commission. Because up until this point, we have said that if the solar panels are visual, visible from the public way, we tend to deny them, particularly if they're in a very important house. Um, we've had. Uh, Concord Academy students actually came before us a couple of months ago and did a presentation on technology and new options with, with solar panels. And we are hoping that the technology is going to improve enough that we're going to get thin enough panels or invisible enough panels or they're actually making solar panels out of the shingles now. Right. Um, where we can start approving these, and obviously it's, it's in the town's interest, we're all interested in environmental and energy conservation, et cetera. So we'd like to be heading down that road, but at the moment, the policy with the existing panels is not on the front of, in front of the house. The, yeah. the only yeah. thing that I'd add is that we don't do this in a vacuum. You know, the reason we have announcements in the newspaper and have a public hearing is we encourage your neighbors to come and you know, say, well, I don't want him to do that, or I want, that's okay with me. And we really take that into consideration when we try to solve some of those issues, okay? So, and, you know, if your neighbors all came and said, it's okay with me if he builds this garage in the front of his house, then we'd be more likely to say yes to it, okay? Don't worry about that, <laughs> Enough. Not so sure I agree, but. Don't fight over this lady. No. <laughs>
<laughs> Amy Barrett, 222 Independence Road. I'm actually here on behalf of Suzanne and Fabian Fondrist, who are not able to be here. They're not in favor of this. Um, and while I will applaud the efforts of the HDC, I, as a broker, um, do agree with what you said, that when you do go to sell, there are additional layers that are involved, that approvals will have to be met, and there are some people who embrace that. There are many others who don't, and it is our feeling, and again, I have nothing against the HDC, but I just think it's important for a homeowner to be able to make their own decisions to what they want to do to their house and not be told what to do by a different entity. Um, I also wanted to comment on the Bow Street project. I actually had a conversation with the um, developer, and yes, it passed, and I really praise the HTC as well as the developers for hanging in there, for having the tenacity, the energy, and the expense to deal with that, but that took a year to pass from what I was told, and I could be wrong. I'll let you guys correct me if I am. Um, so it, sometimes it's not an easy process. Um, and I guess my one question that I have, and I'm still trying to wrap my hands around it, are, is regarding the windows. And I, windows can be so incredibly costly in and of themselves, but what position does the HTC, HDC take to um, have thermopane windows? Are they, is it, are, is the, um, Decision, are the decisions more often to have custom-made windows? Can you have the um, environmentally um, sound and, and um, more energy-saving uh, windows in place, or do you have to have them custom-made? Custom yeah, Amy, I can answer that, okay. First of all, oftentimes windows are replacement in kind. So in other words, they're replacing windows with almost identical windows, but are more modern and hence more energy efficient. They don't even have to come before us for that, okay? In some of the historic districts where we have windows that are, you know, 12 over 12s, individual panes and things like that, we ask that the owners duplicate that. Most hardly ever do they have to be custom built, okay? Um, oftentimes, it's the Anderson Architectural Series that they replace them with. We go through that all the time, okay? So, again, we try not to burden the homeowner, but we also try to make sure that they're duplicating sort of what was there, okay? I also and yes, I, I'll, I'll answer the question. Bow Street, we went through several uh, renditions of that property, okay? Mainly because we didn't think it was appropriate for them to build a 4,000-square-foot house on a lot that had been a 1900 square foot house in that neighborhood, and the neighbors were supportive of that effort. Okay. Say again. Hi, I'm Justin King. I'm one of two real estate agents who are on the uh, Historic Districts Commission. I mean, I do think sometimes there could be misinformation about this subject in general. Bow Street did take a while. Uh, it did not take a year, and it, it was extended partly because the owner came, the builders came back trying to make changes again and again after certain things had been decided. I'll also point out, <clears throat> since it's a matter of public record, if you want to look uh, at what that house sold for, it was a very, very successful financial transaction. So the builders did very, very well, even with the parameters of the HTC. I would say, you know, something like number 30, I mean, <clears throat> we've allowed garages, they have to be tasteful, they have to work within the context of what's happening, but the idea that we're automatically gonna deny that, it's gonna uh, take down the, the value of the house is just not, not correct. And I'd also say, a lot of people wanna come to Concord because of the charm and historic nature of this town. There's a <sighs> kind of a intangible value that comes with that. I mean, if we, took these districts away, and if you could buy, build condos right next to Orchard House and Emerson's house, I mean, just to go the opposite direction, I think you'd see prices on all of our houses going down precipitously. So I think this argument that somehow being to the HDC automatically means a diminution of house prices is not correct. And to follow up on that point, Heather, I think you, you am I correct that you said that there are studies out there that have looked at historic districts and the value in historic districts? And generally speaking, if you're living in a historic district, you will find that the value of your house is, has gone up, not down. I appreciate the issues that, that Amy has brought up, though. I mean, there, there's, you have to sort of balance it. Yes, there's hassles to being in the district. 
Um, I'm not necessarily make, having a question, uh, just a comment. Uh, we, we bought our house 15 years ago, coming from the south end of Boston, which was historic. Your, your name and your address? Oh, sorry. Robin Garrison, 53 Middle Street. And uh, we specifically bought where we bought because it was not in the historic district, because we have experience with doing renovations with a historic district. And we just honestly did not want to go through the hassle. So that's just, you know. And, you know, we have no preconceived notion here. I mean, if the, if, for this to pass in town, if this goes forward, okay, I hate this. I think you can hear me better without it. But if this goes forward, what transpires is we write a warrant that goes before town meeting in April. It takes two thirds of the town to support it for it to go. The last thing we want to do is foist the historic district upon the people that reside in that neighborhood. If we don't, if, you know, that's not our intent whatsoever. We think it's worth the effort to try to do it, and that's why we're right. This glad is to have really our tonight. very first step, and we want to get the feedback to see how you all feel about it. And that's the whole purpose of tonight. So let's have some questions from this side of the room. Um, I'm Sorrel Sammons. I'm at 48 Academy Lane, which used to be 84 Sudbury Road, but they <laughs> changed. Um, first of all, I, I, mean, I very much appreciate the mission of the historic district and having grown up in a small town in Macon, Georgia, with a lot of history and not a lot of good zoning, if you will. Um, it, you know, I appreciate what you do. But um, I have one question. How detail, well, two questions, but the first is very logistical. How, how small a change would I need to come for? For instance, um, we just put in some floodlights above our garage for the only sole purpose of some, you know, uh, late night, meaning 6 p.m. when it gets dark, basketball, for a very short period of time during the year. And it happened to be kind of on a whim because we had an electrician there. Um, if I'm going to replace my bulkhead, which will need to be done, if I use wood instead of metal um, as is currently there, do I have to run those very small things by you? Um, and if I do, that's a little problematic for me because a lot of this, it's hard to get contractors. Um, and some of this, as I said, is kind of last minute. Um, the second thing is a, a bigger reservation, and it relates to solar panels. It relates to the cell tower. Um, and it relates to a rumor that I heard uh, the crosswalk going to, from across Main Street at Concord Academy, where my sons have had to cross and nearly been hit by a car. I had heard that some safety uh, uh, implements were not installed there due to the, it being historic district. Not true. Um, or maybe that was people assuming that bright flashing lights would not pass. I don't know. Uh, anyway, I am very nervous about this district. As you said, your sole purpose is aesthetics, which I totally appreciate. Um, in my family, that's my husband's role. I'm the very functional person, and I am nervous to have someone whose role is aesthetic to be able to put the hammer down and say no to things like a cell tower um, or things like solar powers, which are in the best interest of the environment. Um, it's, it's a lot of power that you have, and in these circumstances, we don't have a way to appeal that and perhaps pass it when health and safety and the environment are involved. So that's my bigger reservation, but my smaller question was, how detailed are these little changes that I have to come to you for? Right, I'm gonna try and remember all of that, but <laughs> um, I'm afraid as far as the detail, I'm afraid small does still matter if it's visible. And so I, I'm not gonna lie to you, if you wanted to put up a light fixture or change your bulkhead and it's visible, I'm afraid it requires an application. I totally hear you. I live in the district. When I first moved here, I didn't know anything about living in a district. And I go through the same thing, but I look at it from the standpoint, it's saving me from having the two houses across the street turn into monoliths. So there, there's a trade-off there. The safety issue, not, not on our watch. That was not an issue. Um, the solar panels, you've heard what I had to say about that, and I know it's a problem for a lot of us, and hopefully that will be something that changes. The cell tower, that's a whole different ballgame. it's probably a bigger thing that you probably yeah. can't answer, but it's something that I worry about the town with you having the final 
right. ability to shut something down. Um, it's not your one voice of many, but it seems to mm -hmm. me that you can stop a project solely based on aesthetics. That makes me very nervous, and the more territory we give, the more nervous that makes me. Right. I will say, though, again, this is, these are all public hearings, and, and as, as Mark said, we, we do try to take into account everything that's being said, um, and we are swayed by what people say, and so we, we aren't a, a group of 10 people ruling the town. Mm -hmm. It is, there's input from everywhere all the way along the way, and other boards, other committees, other commissions, you know, it's not just us. Okay. So. Laylee Suttler, 58 Belknap Street. I have one selfish question, <laughs> which is if you look at the map, we are in the elbow of Belknap Street. Fifty-eight. So if you, if you, right no, there. across the street, across, uh, the, ac oh, that one? that's fifty. So go there, there, there. That's our house. We are not on this street, but you can, if you're walking down Belknap Street, you can see the back of the street, uh, back of the house. Are are we in the historic district? Given that we're not on the street, I mean, I, it's a, it's a very very small lot. We don't we don't. But your address is Belknap Street, right? Yeah, we're not going to do any you know yeah, architectural stuff, changes. Yeah. But anyway, that's what? Yeah, yeah, well, there's a driveway uh, between the Earls and the. So then the other question I have is. Your board, it's, in, it's, it's a very uh, interesting board because all your decisions are aesthetic ones. So your members are comprised of, what, what, what's the background of your members and how, do you, how, do, how are new members, how do they come onto the board? What are the criteria? Yeah, I, I can explain. Uh, uh, there's 10 members, okay, and they generally are supposed to have five-year terms, okay, and there's five associate members and then five full members, and it's the full members that do the voting on the applications, okay. Um, currently, we have a full board, okay. We have two lawyers, two architects, a two, two real, estate real estate agents, okay. Lands landscape designer. Um. And I'm a paper salesman, okay. <laughs> Kate, All right. I'm trying to think. Kate is. Kate's. Um, she's, she's, a, she's a historical. She's, he, yeah, yeah, she's worked yeah. in museums and stuff like that. Okay. Preservation. All right. right. So, did I cover everybody? I th okay. think that's pretty So, close. It's, it's really, you know, just a group of people. We try to get a couple of architects on there, but we oftentimes have difficulty with that because if they have a conflict of interest, they have to accuse themselves. Okay. So, um, that can be an issue. Um, you know, we like to have a lawyer on there just to sort of make sure that we're doing everything the appropriate way. Not that we get into legal problems, don't misunderstand me, but they just have a good sense about those things. But to get on it, we're always looking for new members. We have a turnover of one every year. We have a, a membership opening coming up. You put in a green card to town hall like you do for all these, okay? And then we look at that and, you know. There, there are, though, five appointing bodies. Right. Um, so. The, now see if I can remember, then I prob probably won't. There's uh, the select board, the planning department, the museum, the library, and NRC are the five appointing boards. They each appoint one full member and one associate member for a term, a five-year term, and they, they all roll, if you will, so we don't all come off at the same time. And so those are the appointing members. And then it, all of those are approved by the select board. Is that correct, Jane? Um, Susan Bates, Concord Green. Uh, my question was about in the in the middle of the properties listed is Forty Stowe Street. It's the it's, that's the umbrella. 
building, Emerson Umbrella? Yes, that was in the pictures, but it's not necessarily within the district. But I mean, it's listed on your list of properties proposed to be included in the district. And I just wondered what, the, yeah, it's not on that map, it's no. off. But um, what you're thinking was, well, behind including it and whether there are any other buildings on Stowe Street on that block that are already in a an historic district. No, and that property would sorry. No, and that property would not be included in the expansion of the district. Okay. We believe it warrants further discussion with the town manager and the board of selectmen um, to include that building or not, um, and maybe um, further expansion down Stowe Street or Hubbard Street um, in the future, looking at expanding districts and creating new districts, I think we'll revisit it at that time. But it warrants further discussion with the town because it is a town-owned building. Hi, I'm Henry Smith. Uh, I own 119, 121 Sudbury Road, but don't live there. My son lived there for a while. Um, I have two questions, one procedural and one personal. The procedural one is, I'm assuming that if the town votes to include the expansion of the uh, historic district, that we all will be included, that there's no opting out on an individual basis. And the personal question is the, the house, which is the yellow Italianate house on Sudbury Road, um, was built for my grandmother, uh, Margaret Blanchard, and her husband, Henry F. Smith. Uh, it was subsequently bought by my godfather, Eric Parkman Smith, whom I'm sure many of you know. Uh, and he left it to me. Uh, he had divided the main house into two units, which he was renting out. Um, and as you can see on the drawing, it, there's, a, there's a second building on the property, which is the barn. When, when I uh, inherited the property, I went into the barn, and you could still smell the feed in the troughs because they had kept cattle and horses there that close to town. Um, I've had several, so th th this part of my question is both like the ones that the brokers were asking uh, about uh, property values and also personal. Uh, I've had several people write to me and say they'd like to uh, buy the barn and turn it into a dwelling. I, I think the size of the property was designed specifically so it could allow that, although I haven't actually looked into that. Um, also, I've thought that my children who lived in the main part of the house might like to come back. If the barn were turned, it's a wonderful barn, but it's a barn, and if it were turned into a dwelling, it would need some windows. I, it could, the, the footprint could remain the same. I, I would have no need to change any of it, but it probably would need some windows on the front. I don't know whether that would ever pass muster, but it's an example of what could be a problem. You know, we really can't answer that without seeing exactly what you're talking about, okay? I mean, um, we understand what you'd be trying to accomplish and, you know, would be supportive of that. We've had other buildings that have been, you know, similar things have been done to it. Um, we'd really have to see what you intend to do, what your neighbors thought about what you intend to do, okay, so. And we can only do that through an application. Now oftentimes we have people come in before filing an application and saying, this is what I'm thinking about doing, what do you think about this, okay? And you know, asking us for suggestions as to how to proceed and things like that, if that makes sense, okay, so. I'm Ned Perry, 362 Bedford Street. Uh, the last expansion of the historic districts uh, out Sudbury Road was, I believe, in the early in the mid 1990s. The proposed, and Eric Smith, Eric Parkman Smith, was at the hearing, and I saw him trying to get his hand up 
And so I encouraged the moderator to recognize him. And he stood up and he said, um, and he owned about five houses in the area. Um, and he said, I'm all in favor of the expansion. I don't view historic districts as a control on me and my properties. I view it as protecting my properties from my neighbors. I rented 119 from Eric. I love the barn. And if you, you're well aware that your cousin, Sandy Smith, uh, redid the barn, which is on Academy Lane 25, um, and did it uh, with working with one of the local contractors, uh, cleaned out all the grain that was in between the floors, uh, still from the barn and the hay, and did a spectacular job um, restoring it in a very historic manner. We used to live at 21 Thoreau Street, uh, which uh, was not even in the proposed district, but was right next to 277 Main Street. And to allay some of the fears of not being able to do anything to your properties, um, 277 Main Street did not have its garage behind it, which is unnumbered. And all the neighbors fought it, and the historic districts allowed the garage to be built, cutting down 20 trees and putting up a horrendous garage. The owners subsequently didn't enjoy the property and have now left, and we left before they left. Thank you. Hi, my name is Susan Nesson. I've lived in the Mary Peabody Man House, 67 Sudbury Road for 48 years. I have seen everything in this town. <laughs> And of most of it, I have approved up. Eight years ago, a young man across the way, I believe it is your cousin's, Eric Smith's house that was, has been destroyed. What was the house right across? Um, does anyone know? Uh, the one that was torn down. Yes. No, 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 no. The one right across from me, where they built the two horrors. Three. Yeah, three houses. Yeah, Corner of Academy. And I met this young man, full of bright-eyed and sunshine, and I said, look, explain what the neighborhood was, what it meant. And he looked me in the eye and said, you don't have to worry. I'm only going to put a very favorable addition on one house. What he did was build two huge houses there, move one, which was OK, and has frankly destroyed the heart of two of the most historic, important houses, not only in Concord, but in America, okay? So all I can say to those of you who don't want an historic district, I'm an art historian. I taught American architectural history, and one thing I can tell you, you will make a lot more money if your house is an historic district because for the reason that what happened across the way to me can happen to you, okay? It, I, I'm her husband, and she may hate me for this, but uh, uh, the, the, the question I have is, will the commission deal with density in the area? The, the situation where you had this one lovely house, and now they built really three. And, and let me add to that the Emerson umbrella, which has tr totally changed the neighborhood. Do you deal with that at all? Okay. <laughs> I'm not even going to touch the umbrella. <laughs> but on the other issue, HDC only opines, if you will, on applications that come before us. We have, if somebody has a lot that is subdivi subdividable, they have the frontage, they have the setbacks, whatever, and the zoning allows them to have two houses where pre previously there was one, we are required to work with them for two houses. We can't say to them, oh no, we only want one house on that, that joint lot, you can't have two houses. We do not have that uh, authorization. We have to work with what the existing zoning laws are. However, 
um, let's say somebody has a lot and they want to put up a 4,000 square foot house and they currently have the setbacks and the frontage and whatever and within the um, uh, allowances they can do that. If it comes before HDC and a 4,000 square foot house is completely out of character with the neighborhood, completely out of proportion with the other houses on the street, we do have you know, the jurisdiction to work with that person to say, you know, 4,000 is probably a little aggressive. Can we work it to, to more of a, a realistic size for the neighborhood? But, it, but we can't, you know, if, if they're able to build three houses, we have to allow three houses. It's just that we have say over what they build. So. Um, Deborah Conkey, I live at 53 Belknap Street. You partially addressed one of my questions when you said what will happen if this is approved. Um, you said it would go to town meeting. What happens before that? Who decides whether it goes to town meeting? Well, and then my second question is, this all seems really arbitrary to me. Like, okay, you have a 10 member panel and you decide based on aesthetics, which seems very, you know, like I said, who decides what is aesthetically, you know, correct? That's not really so, the question. But so two, it's not I, heard, really I, heard, I heard two questions, okay. Um, let me address the second one first, where you said it's arbitrary in aesthetics. We have a folder, a binder, that articulates everything that we try to accomplish, okay? And it's public information. You can read it. It talks about windows. It talks about all of that stuff, okay? And that's, that's our guideline, okay? And that's what we go by, okay? So we try not to be arbitrary about it because one's person's taste is perhaps not universal, okay? So, um, so I hope that we don't appear to be arbitrary in the way we make these decisions, okay? We, are, we don't necessarily have to abide by what we've done last year when we make this decision. We treat every case as an individual case. But remember, I've said it before, we take in the neighbors' comments into consideration very strongly. I mean, you know, this, that's part of the whole business that we're about, if you will, okay? Um, all right, so that was your second question. Um, the first question was the process of getting to town meeting. Thank you, thanks. Um, what happens is, based upon the feedback that we get tonight, we decide whether we go forward with this or not, okay? If we decide to go forward with it, a warrant gets written, gets posted by like January 4th or something like that, okay, and it gets into the town warrant. And then at town meeting, you know, we, before we do that, we get support of the select board. You know, we go through the process of trying yeah, to get support. There's hearings along the way. It's right. not okay. direct from December right. to town meeting. And then it goes to town meeting, and in order to pass, it requires two-thirds vote from town meeting, okay? but. And I'm going to speak personally. The last thing that we want is to go to town meeting and have a number of neighbors stand up and say, this is a bad idea, okay? Because we've wasted everybody's time at that point. Because, you know, the townspeople believe that people should control their property. I think that's fundamental to what we do, okay? And I think it would be very difficult and contrary to our purpose to try to force things on people. Does that answer your question? Uh, patient, hi, Alan Proctor, 57 Sudbury Road. Uh, we've heard reference to uh, this uh, proposal going to town meeting. Uh, I believe when I spoke with the commission uh, oh, two or three weeks ago, I was the one member from the neighborhood who happened to make it to your meeting, that somebody said that the, uh, the final determination is not with the town meeting, but with the state attorney general. Can somebody confirm yes. that? A absolutely right. The, the state attorney general, it doesn't become effective until the attorney general's office signs off on it. That's, okay. that's what I thought. Which, which takes a couple of months after town meeting. Right. Now, why they sign off on it or don't sign off on it, you know, I have no idea. Okay. Maybe, maybe Dennis Fiore can answer that for us. Dennis, hang on. Um, 
Um, I, I, I sat on, on the HDC for six or seven years, but I also am a state commissioner of the Historic Preservation Commission. And to answer your question, it's in, the, it's in his office, but it's the Historic Preservation Commission that has to sign off on any districts across the state. Um, and so that's why it goes through. It's part of, the, uh, part of state law. They can't just be arbitrarily um, uh, committed by a community. They have to be passed on by the, uh, by the state also. While I have the microphone, since I've got you captured, uh, <laughs> I, I think the question, I hear the question of taste coming up all the time. It makes my hair go up in the air. We don't sit, I know, I know, I know. And I had a haircut recently. Um, we're not about taste, we're about suitability. What fits in the neighborhood? What, what, uh, what the scale is? how it fits in with other buildings that are there. We don't discourage, by the way, uh, more contemporary buildings. I would like to think of us, uh, the HDC, as a community preservation rather than the historic preservation. Any of you at the town meeting heard a developer uh, wanting to tear down a house because Washington didn't sleep there. Well, in the historic district, there are a number of houses that are historic to Concord, historic characters, but there are others that are just wonderful properties that make up the whole character uh, of the town. Uh, and you know, if the town is, is frozen in amber, uh, that isn't good either. I mean, uh, there's a way of, of creating beautiful buildings and beautiful structures that carry on the heritage and the feeling of the town o over time. So we're, uh, we've, when I was there, we were interested in that. Um, I'd also like to comment on the cell tower because um, the uh, cell tower was not killed by HDC initially. It was killed by the State Historic Preservation Commission. Uh, because the old manse is the National Register property, you can't have any structure that is in its, in its view, in its view shed. And so because that stuck up from where it was, so maybe you ought to hope for a really big one uh, if they're going to propose it in your neighborhood because it'll never get through if it can be seen by the old manse. I'm not sure what other, is Wright Tavern a National Register? I'm not sure. But so. if, it's, if it's in sight view of any other major structure, then, then it won't be built. Uh, they, they, they will turn it down. Um, the other point I want to make, uh, and it was Amy's asking about windows. <coughs> As the HDC know, I was, a, I was a fanatic on saving windows. Was yeah, I was a window Nazi. But there's some, uh, and I think we have a member who knows more about windows than, than I do on the, on the commission. But they've done some work, and the state had done some work nationally to prove that, that a lot of these uh, energy saving windows are frankly bogus. Uh, they don't work very well, and a well constructed, restored window is almost as energy efficient as putting on a new one. Uh, so, uh, and, you know, I would encourage you not to just toss your windows out, but to spend some time on, on making sure these win the, the windows you have um, uh, are energy efficient. Thank you, Ralph Earl again, 50 Belknap Street. Uh, Dennis, with all due respect, uh, the energy efficient windows today are five to six times more efficient than a single glazed window, and it's not bogus. Uh, we built a net zero house up in New Hampshire, in New Hampshire on a lake, um, and it has triple glazed windows in the house. We go there in the winter when it's cold here because our 200 year old house here is drafty and that house isn't. So, um, but I, I have uh, one very specific factual question. Uh, one analytic question and a suggestion. The very specific factual question, if I heard what you said correctly, it's just the facade of the house that is governed by the Historic District Commission. What is visible from the public way, which could be the sides of the house. It depends but, on how the but if somebody has to go down your driveway to see the side of the house. No, it's standing on the street. Um, the second thing is, I, I think the economic question that people are asking is not whether your house appreciates, but how does it appreciate relative to houses that aren't in the historic district? And you've got a really good data set there. Uh, uh, Heather, I read your documents very carefully. It refers to, I think, other historic districts. It would be very interesting to compare Concord, which has a large data set of historic district houses, to those that are adjacent to them and look at the percentage increase over time. Um, I think that would uh, answer a lot of questions. That's a good suggestion. Um, we live at 50 Belknap Street. The house was built in 1815, moved to that site in 1850. Uh, Jane and I love historic houses. We have taken great care to do, uh, as our neighbors know, and I've been very patient through, a lot of renovations that are historically consistent. I'm on the fence about whether or not we want to be in the historic district. We've said for 27 years we have the best of both worlds. We have a historic house that's not in the historic district. Um, 
I wonder, and so this is a suggestion, I wonder if the Historic District Commission has considered language that it can provide to homeowners that it would allow them to put that as a rider in the deed of their house that would preserve the visible parts as a codicil, to, I, I, I'm not a lawyer, whatever the appropriate legal term, uh, but essentially as a covenant to the deed of the house that the facade cannot be changed. If this does not go through, I would guess that there would be a number of people that would consider that. It would take the house out of the process of the HDC while still preserving the historical facade and keeping the character of the town, which seems to me is your primary objective. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't, I understand what you're saying, and it would, Those would be a preservation restriction, um, and that I believe is done through the state. Um, sometimes holds the preservation restrictions, but that's something private homeowners would do and can do. I don't, um, but I can try to find some for you if you want to give me your contact information. Um, just one thing I did want to point out that I don't know if everyone knows exists, but about a year, a year and a half ago, they passed the floor area ratio. Um, at, we tried to add um, a, just a couple of feet to our garage, to which would the, our footprint would stay the same, but we would be able to put a floor to have an upstairs and downstairs in that garage. And it was, um, well, we withdrew it before they could reject it, but they said that the ratio of our house, even without doing that, the floor area to the acreage um, was too large, but we're grandfathered in, and um, that to do that, even though the footprint stayed the same, it added an extra 400 square feet, so it was not allowed. So there are precautions that do exist out there from preventing what happened on the corner of Sudbury and Academy across the street from me from happening now. So um, there are some uh, fallbacks there that we can rely on. That was through the ZBA. Um, and now people can appeal to have that bypassed if they're just going over their ratio a little bit. But, you know, a lot of our houses, I'd say, in this district are already surpassing it. So if it's basically if somewhere were to destroy a house like the one on middle and build something new, there is, a, you can't build an oversized house anymore without going through these massive exemptions and the chances are it would not get passed. So that's something relatively new that I'm not sure if everybody knew about. To, to counter that, I think it very much depends on the property. We've heard from a lot of people who say that while the FAR new regulations have helped in some senses, in other senses, still enormous houses are allowed to go up on lots where the house is very much out of proportion with the neighborhood, et cetera. But you're right, in, in certain cases, the FAR does take care of the issue. Yes, yes. Fair enough, yeah. Leslie Fisher, 43 Middle Street. I think Ralph's idea of individual uh, homeowners getting a historic what was the term you used? Preservation restriction. Preservation restriction is great, but it doesn't do what Eric Smith was concerned about, which was protect your street or you from your, what your neighbors want to do, because they might not opt to get that restriction. We bought our house and were notified before we took possession of the house by the former owner in 1995 that they were considering making our street in the district. Um, we were disappointed to find out that it was withdrawn. Um, it's easy for me to say that I, I, I definitely am in favor of this. I needed to say that out loud because it sounds like a lot of people are not, but I want to let you know that I am. I do admit that it's easy for me to say that because we subsequently did put an addition on our house without restrictions. I would hope that it would have been 
accepted pretty much as is, or I would have gotten some wise advice about how to make it more compatible. I think I trust the commission really has the best interests of the town at heart. And I'm willing to give up a little bit of my rights or my desire to do anything I damn please for the greater good. So I just wanted to say that. I want to point out too that I think it's four of us currently are live in one of the districts. So we know what it's like to be on the other side of the table. Um, so it, it's not like it's, it's us against you. We, we've been there. So we're sensitive to that fact. It's not, it's not easy. I'm Julie Trent from 31 Thoreau Street. Um, that was eloquent. I'm sorry to say that I'm still on the fence. And I'm wondering if, as the woman on the far end was speaking about um, you know, ratios of space that you can add and things like that, is, is there written documentation that people can look at before this goes to the next step or whatever? The, the FAR, I believe, is part, is part of the zoning. Zoning, zoning, right? Okay, that's a zoning. Right, and that applies exactly to the whole town. So that is something that would be on the website for, the, um, for zoning. That's nothing to do with us. Okay, the, the guidelines that I think we f referred to earlier, those are on the town website. There's a separate um, HD Historic Districts Commission has their own section. And then within that, there is, you know, what an application looks like, what the guidelines are, that kind of stuff. So you can get a lot of information. And if you don't find what you're looking for, the two Heathers, as we call them, are fabulous. <laughs> they, are, they are truly a, a wealth of information. They set us straight. We ask them the questions. You ask them the questions. And if they don't have the answer at their f fingertips, they'll, they'll find it. They are so resourceful. They're, they're wonderful. Sorry. Robin Garrison, 53 Middle Street. I actually have a question. What do you know what percentage of the dwellings of the homes in Concord are in the historic district and presently? And what is your goal percentage wise with your expansion? I can tell you that we have no goal in terms of saying that 40% of the homes should be in the historic district, okay? I think we're sort of looking at this as a case-by-case -case basis. And, you know, as I said a couple of times, it was Sudbury Road that drove us to do this and include it up to Main Street because that was a, an, I don't want to say easier, but a more viable way was to expand the Main Street historic district, okay? You know, um, the town has a demolition delay bylaw which is effective for up to a year, okay? But after that, they can do whatever they want to do. And we've seen cases where, you know, that hasn't preserved the home or we haven't been, and it was done with the intent that another purpose get fined, you know, during that year, but it really hasn't worked out that way, okay? I'm just, I'm just curious, I guess I worded it wrong. What, what is the percentage right now? I have no idea, okay? I, you know, I'm, we can probably get that information for you, okay, because we know how many homes are on, and it's just a, a percentage of the homes in Concord, okay, so. Amy Barrett, 222 Independence Road. As a, as a resident of Concord who does not live in any of these roads that are considered to be part of the HDC, I would feel awful voting for something that the members in majority aren't in favor of or are in favor of and voting against what they would like. Um, I think it'd be really, really helpful for the HDC to query everybody in the areas that are proposed to call, fall under that purview so that we really have a feeling for what the neighborhood as a whole is, is feeling. Well, Amy, that's one of the things that we had hoped to accomplish this evening was to get feedback from the citizens. That's why we've spent, you know. The, the other thing we've done, Amy, is um, there's 51 houses that were on the list, and we divided up all those houses and attempted to call every single person. 
now in today's world, number one, half the people don't have a landline anymore, so most of the, the, you know, the town listings are defunct, or they have cell phones and nobody ever picks up their cell phone from a number they don't you know, know. Um, so, for example, I called six people and I thought it was, you know, I'd hit the jackpot to actually speak to three human beings. Um, but I left messages and whatever. So we are making every effort to get hold of everybody to get their feedback. We've sent letters, we've sent postcards, we've posted it everywhere, and we've encouraged people to, to, to get in touch with us because we really do want it, um, the feedback. And I agree with you entirely. I don't think anybody's going to vote for this if they feel that the people in the district don't want it. I mean, it's, you know, the town doesn't work like that because they know that it could, they could turn around and happen to them. So I just, you know, but we are genuine. And, and if you know neighbors who weren't able to come tonight or haven't been contacted because we couldn't find their number or they've moved or somebody else's who knows what, please encourage them to get in touch with us because we do want to hear from everybody. And, you know, and we, we sent out the survey and we, what, heard like 30% back? Yeah. 30% respond to the survey. Okay. Well, maybe we send something else out and see. Pardon me? That is to help us get feedback on taking, the, basically taping, taking the temperature of the group that's involved. To, to help advise us as to whether it makes sense to move forward or it doesn't. Hey, I know it's late and it's been a great discussion. Now, I'm going to be very short, but I feel like the minority in this room is uh, in the affirmative. And I'm going to cast a vote solidly in the affirmative. I'm going to join my neighbors, the Tripmans, uh, my dear friend Ned Perry, with whom I believe I served on the planning board and was, well, you were on the Board of Zoning Appeals maybe, or were you moderator at the time? We have somehow had something to do with town government. But I was on the planning board when, when the first um, long-range plan for Concord was drafted and was one on the committee. And w one of the things that we all felt was the obligation to preserve the dash NESS, the Concordness of, of, of this town. And it, it obviously has a lot to do with the history. For me personally, I went to architecture school twice. Uh, the visual aspect is important. There's nothing I enjoy more than sitting on my front porch and looking around at the neighborhood and feeling proud and blessed to be here. So uh, I'm, I'm hugely in favor. And you know, in our own uh, immediate neighborhood, th there's an issue that uh, I think this could help us out enormously with. Uh, 30 Middle Street is a, a vacant house, as, as Bob mentioned. Um, it, 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 it's a house that was either torn down and rebuilt or substantially reconstructed in the early 60s to look like a 60s house. And uh, whoever buys that is, is definitely gonna tear it down. And I would feel comforted if there were uh, someone with two architects, two realtors, a landscape architect, overseeing what goes there. Uh, I know that this might impose some additional cost and inconvenience for me during the temporary period of time that I occupy our house, but I think enduring that is uh, worth it uh, for the long run. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you say your name and address for the record? Oh, me? Yeah. Uh, you don't want to know me. I'm Dick Cross at 38 Academy Lane. Oh, you. Yes. <laughs> That's better. Thank you. Uh, I'm Janet Valiant from 35 Belknap Street. I would like to just, I may not get it exactly, but I think I remember the f opening line of that long range plan to which he just referred, which was that the people of Concord have an obligation to the nation. And then it went on. And it reminded me of the fact that I have done a lot of work with people from the, first the Soviet Union and then Russia. And I remember bringing them to Concord over and over again and going out to the site of, to, to the historic sites and then bringing them back into the town and having them comment how impressed they were that here was this beautiful town that was like a 
museum to preserve one of the finest moments of our country and that there were real people living here and life was going on. And I felt so proud at that time to be from this town and frankly, it makes you very patriotic. Thank you. Sorry, just a couple more. Hello, this is Jim Trent from 31 Theroux Street. One of the things I see that this is an expansion effort, right? Um, does Main Street uh, going west past Theroux Street, is that part of the historic district? Not as of right now, but that's something we would look at in the future. And what I'm thinking is, is that there are certain areas that are already starting, if, if not haven't already formed it or may begin starting to form it. Uh, living on Thoreau Street, there are a couple of houses across the street that are not in being even considered for this district, and there are a couple of residential ones right near Main Street. So how can certain houses on the Road Street be in a historic district and the ones across the street not be, which I would think would make them much more open to, you know, the complete purchase of and do whatever the buyer wants to do there. So why don't you, you know, why hasn't a footprint then considered just to make those couple of houses there because they are part of the same street, just across the street. It's not even across the railroad track. You know what kind of bad feeling that can be for some people. So I would think that you should think about that and consider it. And if there's anything you want to know from me, I'm happy to talk to you about that. We appreciate that. My understanding is my understanding is when the historic districts were originally put together in 62, if people didn't want to participate in it, they were allowed to exempt from it, okay? We had some properties over in Hubbardsville that were, you know, right next to other, the Chester French House that was exempted from it because they didn't want to participate. So I appreciate your comments on Thoreau Street. You know, it's probably something we need to look at, but you know, it's a big deal, as you know, all of us here tonight talking about it. I mean, it's a very sensitive issue, so, okay. Well, thank you all very much for coming tonight. We appreciate your coming out on such a freezing cold night. I guess we should be grateful it's not snowing yet. Um, but please follow up with us. If you have more questions, concerns, please get in touch with Heather or you know, she'll figure out a way to get hold of us. And please encourage your neighbors to speak up, speak out, let us know how they feel. We appreciate all your time and effort tonight to let us know what your thoughts are. So, thank you. Thank you.